the colon. So the colon is something everybody needs to do. So I want to just go from the mouth. Um, all the way down. Digestion starts in the mouth. Okay, so this is why I've always told you when you ask me any questions, I say what? Chew your food 30 times per bite. This is very important. You have four, four, you have four, no, four saliva glands uh, in your mouth. And you, you produced about 0.7 to one liter of saliva a day. Did you know that? Isn't that fascinating? That's a lot of saliva, isn't it? There's a reason there's a lot of saliva. So there's four of them. And so this is why I always say you need to drink your food and chew your drink. You need to chew your food 30 times per bite. My kids used to ask me, they said, do you count every time that you chew, that you eat? And I said, no, I've been doing it for so long that I just automatically chew my food very, very well. And, and as you understand this, as I go through this, you're going to understand this better. And you're going to say, okay, that makes sense. That's why he's telling me to chew my food 30 times per bite. We're talking about the mouth. We're going to go through the whole digestive process. Okay. So we're going to talk in the mouth. We're going to chew the food 30 times per bite. We've got four saliva glands and we produce 0.7 to one liter of saliva per day. Now, um, saliva carries calcium hormones and some immune uh, system stuff entered the saliva from the blood. And the saliva carries also painkillers. Uh, did you know that? That saliva has painkillers in it and that it's uh, stronger than morphine. It's uh, opiophin. Opiophin. If I say it right, opiophin. Um, and now the saliva, it doesn't have enough that you're going to get all dazed and crazy on it. So you're not going to go, woo, I'm stoned on my own saliva. Um, but saliva kills bacteria, but it keeps good bacteria in your mouth, a certain amount of benign bacteria in your mouth, because it has to, right? And so we keep a small amount of good bacteria. And then you have this ring of immune system in the back of your throat. Did you know that? See, there's, you have the ones that everybody wants to cut out of you, right? And then you have the two that they can't cut out that are connected to your tongue. It's a good thing that they can't cut those out. Um, and you get to keep those, but I have all mine and which is a good thing. And that is your immune ring. So everything that passes by there has sensories going, Hey, is there something going on? If there's something bad in here, right? So the tissues encircle our entire throat. Pretty cool. It's almost like it was well thought out, isn't it? Um, and then it goes down the esophagus which is that long thing that goes down there. And the it enters the stomach from the right-hand side. It doesn't enter, like most people say, oh, it just enters the top of the stomach. Well, that would be a problem because every time you walk, every time you talk, you double the amount of pressure on your colon. I mean, you double the amount of pressure on your stomach. So walking, you're like, and just doing that. Now, when you laugh or cough, it's like four times the amount. So you're, on there. So it's a good thing that it's entering from the right, or you'd be popping things back out all the time. It'd be going through that sphincter all the time. So it doesn't, it enters from the right, which here's a little uh, helpful helpfulness. So the esophagus goes down and, and it keeps the gastric juice in the tummy. Okay. So it doesn't explode out every time you laugh or cough. Um, although some people have puked from laughing so hard. Um, the liquid flows through the right hand side, right into the, um, so it flows in there, right? So everything comes down, goes in the right hand side. This is why it's better to lay on your left hand side. So if you can imagine, so that is sticking up. So gases like burping, right? Which is abbreviation of burbulation. Burbulation is the transfer of gases from different levels in your digestive tract, okay? Or in your stomach. So that's burbulation. And that's where burp comes from, I believe. And that's just me putting that together. I haven't found anything on it. Um, and so you have this, when you're laying on that side, then you don't have the liquid pushing back up through your sphincter. Does that make sense? So that's helpful. If you're having that problem, then and more than likely if people chomp, chomp, swallow, chomp, chomp, swallow, you know, have you ever seen people eat like this? Gassy for the next three hours. 
that makes sense when you think about what's happening. As you, as you chew, we masticate, make into small particles. Their chomp chomp swallow is making into large particles, which large particles need more gastric juices to break it down in the stomach. So it goes into the stomach through the esophagus, right? You can lay on this side, release gases or uh, whatever your problem is. And the interesting thing about your stomach is it's like the Quasimodo of, of organs. It, it is really an interesting area. It has a small section, which when it comes in on the um, liquid flows into the right hand side and then goes directly to the small intestines. So the liquid doesn't have to stay in the stomach too long because the body already knows, all right, direct that down in there, it goes into the small intestines. The large particles of food, and larger for those chomp chomp swallowers instead of the 30 time providers, right? Because we want to be the 30 time chewers. We want to masticate. Masticate. Remember, drink your food and chew your drinks. That's an easy way to remember it, okay? I mean, drink your food and chew your drinks, okay? So it goes in the small intestines, but then the food goes on the left side, and the food is pushed up against the wall and beaten up against the wall, so to speak, that it is smashed and thrown up against the wall until, because depending on how small you've masticated your food, it's going to break it down into the smaller, um, smaller uh, particles. Okay. Then it's going to go down and it's going to go past the liver bile and pancreatic fluids. Now, remember, this is going to be for, these are digestive enzymes and things kind of like your laundry detergent. Have you ever thought about that? It's like soap. It's like laundry detergent. It's actually chemically very similar because it's breaking down proteins, sugars, and fats. And then it's rinsed away. That's the same thing your enzymes are doing, breaking those things down so that we can assimilate them. They have to get into small particles, small molecules. Basically, it's all gaseous, right? I mean, it, it becomes in there so then it can be transferred through a permeable layer of tissue. So as it goes down through, it goes past the liver bile and the pancreas, produce it, then it goes into the small intestine. And now if you could see your small intestine, it's fascinating, it's three to six meters long, right? So at three to six meters long, you think, oh yeah, that's, that's not too bad. It's very clean and it's kind of velvety looking. And there, there's really no bad odor to it. Not like the large intestines, which is all bad odor. But it's, it's clean because that's what that, that noise that you're getting all the time, that's you cleaning the small intestine. It's going to broom sweep everything out at the end of the meal so that it's a clean area again. It's sparkly. There's some really anal retentive people living in your small antennas. They're going to clean up that area. It's like having a big group of maids in there. And they just clean up and make the bed before you can even go back and mess it up. So it's three to six meters. That's, and it's just folds on folds. This is like the folds arena because it's folds. Now, without the folds, it would have to be 18 meters long. Do you see how many folds that is? You go from three to six to 15, I mean, to 18 meters, okay? So you go from 18 meters long. Now, each square inch has 20,000 little fingers little villi, each square inch, or uh, 30 per square millimeter. Does that make sense? Okay, so because I have to do it in, in meters and, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I'm getting better at that, actually. Um, a lot of conversion going on in your brain all the time. So it's about 30 per square millimeter. That's a lot, okay? Now, that's just villi, and it looks like velvet. And then each projection, so each one of these projection, each one of these villi, then has villi on it, microvilli. So each little villi has a villi on it. And that microvilli would then, if you extended that, and then each one of those microvilli has little antlers on it, little like sugar receptors. So they're like going like this off the microvilli, which are 20,000 per square inch on the regular villi. Imagine if you could iron that out, what would it be? If you ironed it out just all the way, it'd be four and a half miles long or seven kilometers. 
seven kilometers in that three meter space all wound up through right there by your tummy. Can you believe that you have that much space because of the folds on the folds and the villi on the villi on the villi? It's fascinating uh, stuff. So the reason that is, this is what always gets me to the part of, this is why you need all six forms of B6. You need to not be eating hydrogenated oil or partially hydrogenated oil or animal fats that are sticky, tallow, pig fat, beef fat, those kind of fats, they're sticky. Okay, these hinder you from assimilating your B6, which produces 60 enzymes and increases your hydrochloric acid production. So now that we're living in the small intestines, and this is where we are, on the villi, on the villi, on the villi, I want you to understand that each one of those little antler receptors is trying to break down, to get a broken down nutrients. If you do not have those 60 enzymes in the hydrochloric acid production and you're not getting your B6s, they're going to bypass that antler area in the villi and go down into the large intestine. It's going to pass through the appendix, pass over the appendix and go to the large intestine, which then causes gas. Have you heard of anybody having problems digesting proteins? Anybody? Maybe just a few people? Maybe they're not getting their 60 enzymes or their hydrochloric acid production. Maybe they're not getting their B6, which then also they're not going to get their B12. Have you ever heard of anybody, especially the elderly, having a problem with blood circulation, oxygenation to the brain, and blood circulation to the brain where they're having thought problems, cognitive problems? Have you heard about anything like this? In the digestive tract. There's manual, millions of cellular functions going on. So if your proteins, maybe your liver and your pancreas are not producing enough, right? Because they are these two little things squirting stuff out there to help you digest things after it leaves the stomach when it goes into the, through the ducts, and then it goes into the small intestines. So if we then start here with what we eat, and take all of our nutrients we need, all 106 minerals, all 54 plus vitamins, and from all sources, eight vitamin E's, six vitamin B6's, stop eating um, high fructose corn syrup, hydrogenated oil, processed sugars, synthetic sugars, um, any of these fractionated man-made substances or anything that's processed, okay? The reason I tell you the, uh, the one about the high fructose corn syrup is, did you know that tryptophan attaches to the sugar? And if you're eating high fructose corn syrup instead of just fruit sugar from fruits, you have an overabundance of high fructose corn syrup or fruit sugar, and it's a modified fruit sugar, it's not a good fruit sugar anyways, then because it's processed has no nutrients with it, just like white sugar has no nutrients with it. Therefore, you cannot assimilate it. It needs other nutrients with it, okay? So the reason I'm telling you this is that the tryptophan attaches under the sugar and that will be flushed down into your large intestines and out the drain and cause you gassy and right. discomfort and problems like that. So then your tryptophan, which is your activator of your serotonin, your happy pill, your feel good, your I'm happy today feeling, okay? And then you have your sleep, your melatonin production, also by your tryptophan. So can you mess that up by eating high fructose corn syrup, processed sugars, corn syrups, modified sugars, fractionated sugars, processed sugars, all devoid of nutrient sugars, and alcohol-based sugars, or anything like that, that. Have you ever seen white sugars? Yeah, they shouldn't be white. Stevia should be green. Dehydrated cane juice is brown and tan. Why? Because it has molasses and it has iron and calcium and all these nutrients in it. You take those away, you have a thief in your system. It is a stealer of everything. And now you're not going to have your tryptophan, which is your happy pill. And trust me, most people need their happy pill. Okay. And then we have our melatonin to help us sleep through the night. 
we're going to lose both of those. And if you don't have those 60 enzymes, you're not going to digest the proteins. Foods. So as we're going through the small intestines and we're trying to figure out through that seven kilometers of area, space, villi on villi on villi, when you do that and you, and you have this, this each villi has a blood vessel in it, okay? So each little villi, when we get on the villi and the microvilli, they all have a little blood vessel in them. So that little, that little blood vessel that is fed the broken down food goes through, right, through osmosis, through that permeable layer of tissue into the blood vessel, okay? And then it goes from the blood to the liver. This is the same thing it does in the large intestines. It goes from the blood to the liver. It cleans it. It checks it for any dirty toxins, um, dangerous substances, something that's not normal for us to eat, right? Maybe synthetics, things that we're not supposed to eat, heavy metals, synthetics, um, things that aren't made for man, not made for our stuff. So those are going to go through, and that blood from the villi is going to go to the liver, and then from the liver, it's going to go to the heart, and then from the heart to every cell in the body. That's after the liver has cleaned it and checked it. Toxins, bad things. Now, that's good unless you're eating bad things. If you take in bad things, that liver is going to get congested, isn't it? It's going to get stopped up. That's a problem. Okay, so then it's not going to be as efficient. And if you just keep eating all that bad stuff, what's going to happen? You're going to plague that thing and it's going to get overwhelmed, right? Okay, makes sense. So the appendix, now as it goes down through the small intestines, it's going to bypass the appendix, which is right underneath here, and it's going to go across here, okay? Everybody goes, oh, the appendix is worthless. Just cut it out. Just cut that thing out. It's worthless. Then why is it there anyways? Isn't it? It's, has anybody ever thought about that besides the guy that makes $18,000 for cutting it out? Nobody's thought about it? Hmm, it's interesting, though, because it is part of the tonsillar immune system. It's part of the ring. So it sits down there, and it is a huge depot of immune cells just waiting for anything that, that made it through the small intestines before it goes into the large intestines to send it out. See, now the large intestines has a large deposit of immune um, itself around it all over the place, okay, these little pockets. But the appendix is just that. It looks like a little collapsed balloon. It's just all shriveled up, but that's what it is. So that when it needs to, it'll eke out some and stick it in there. So if you have a bad bacteria come around, a stomach flu, what will it do? Oh, it starts sending this response, coat the large intestines, send that garbage out of here and you get diarrhea. Poof, it's gone. And then it lines the whole large intestines, protects our system. And the large intestines, of course, has some itself. And then the large intestines going like 23 rhythms a minute or something like that. And what it's doing is it's gonna be the last vestige of getting nutrients from those food particles that you've chewed up, taken down all the way through and has all these things. That's the large intestines and it's going to be, and it's going to go through all that stuff. And it's only about three feet. It's about one meter long. Okay. And it's the final extraction of any remaining nutrients. And it does it in a completely different way. And, it, and it's going to get in there and it's going to go from the blood through that permeable layer of bowel tissue to the liver. And then from the liver, once it finds that it's clean, it's going to send it to the heart and go through every, you know, it's going to, it's going to go to the heart and it's going to go through the whole cardiovascular system. And it's going to then feed the body any of the last nutrients it can. Okay. So it's made of completely different tissue though. And it goes, blah, blah, blah. so you're going to have, it's going to come up the ascending across the transverse and it's going to go up under and then down. It's not like smooth plumbing that you would think would be really easy. It's actually a little bit like this. Now, every stopping point, you'll notice with people, have you ever noticed like uh, Tom Hanks has, let's see, what side is it he has it on? It's on this side. He has, he goes flat here and then big old, 
big old bowel connection right there because this is the facial pressure point to the colon, to the large intestines. So when people have this boom, like that, guys grow goatees to cover that up. What they should do is clean their colon and then this will start tightening up. Now, some people have more of a sag here than normal, just it's generations of, of life. And some people are just structured that way. Other people have a jutting jaw. And, but most people have a little bit of swag there. Now, when you have the big swag or you see that difference between this side and that side, or on the tummy, you can see that big sticking over, that's the colon. What happens is, as it comes up the ascending, this will block going here. So they'll get a puffiness. This is the last real one that does it. The, the one of the worst ones is it comes over here and before it goes up underneath here, heartburn is what we always find that to be, right? Um, it will start just swelling up and get your colon from here to here. Like John Wayne, when he died, he had 26 pounds of undigested rat meat. in his colon. Watch on the internet and look at some of those videos of some people's colons and how big they are and disgusting and filled with garbage and parasites. Okay, so it goes over here. If it makes it through this area right here, then it comes down the descending and then it goes into the sigmoid and then down, okay? And then you have an inner and outer sphincter down there by the sigmoid. So what you have is you have to the heart, uh, the final few inches down by the sigmoid of the large intestines does not go through the liver. It goes directly to the main circulatory system. This is why medications a lot of times will be suppository because it bypasses the cleanliness of the liver and it doesn't get filtered. Dangerous. Yeah. Because if you're bypassing a filter and if that filter would have said, hey, that's not good, because I want the filter to make that decision. I don't want to make that decision. So you know what? I think I could eat this and it'd be okay. I'll just stick it up there and I'll absorb it completely because I'm sure it's perfect. So maybe it's not perfect. I would rather let the liver check it because that's its job. Let everybody do their job correctly. That's what the liver does. So as your colon goes up, goes down, then it comes down to the sigmoid. So the two big stopping points are going to be right here and right down here before the sigmoid when it turns down. A lot of people get bloated in those two areas. And what happens is through the years, the colon goes, well, I've got more stuff and more stuff. And then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And bigger. And then you saw those people with the big colon. And so they have this big colon protruding here. And it's like a big medicine ball or a basketball underneath the skin. I noticed this with my father is when he would sit up wearing a t-shirt, I could see his muscles, but yet you had this colon, right? So dad, that's not fat. That's your colon. You no, no, it's fat, but you know, I've been running and doing this and doing that and I'm trying to lose it. No, it's the colon. You have such impacted crap in there or whatever it is that it stretched you out. And I remember watching a guy um, in three days lose 18 inches and around the waist and about 22 pounds of fecal matter in three days by taking the right amount of stuff to evacuate the colon. Isn't that a fascinating thing? And you know what he told me? He goes, yeah, I've gone to the bathroom like six times a day. Where's all this stuff coming from? That's a crazy amount when you think about it. So that's the colon. That's why the colon formula is probably our second best selling product. Um, it, it's probably our best-selling product that's still underused and underutilized. People don't realize how important this digestive tract is. One, I've tried to give you some ideas on things not to eat and things to do to get them proper. Now, 
when we, um, we're a lower bowel formula, so that's the large intestine is what we're cleaning. When you take the colon formula, you're moving that colon and toning it, toning it back up, strengthening it, giving blood circulation to it. When we're talking about getting the colon toned, you have to take the right amount of the colon formula. Now, most people don't like that. Do you know how many people don't like to go poop? Oh, I don't want to. I don't want to go. If I eat, I'll have to go. I don't want to take your product because then I'm going to have to go to the bathroom. I don't want to go at the office. I'll wait until I get home. I'm glad your car doesn't work that way. Just keeping all that exhaust in a box. And then when you get home, you can let it out. I had a lady, actually, she wanted a refund. She said, I don't like your colon product. I said, really, why is that? She goes, I said, you know, it's been a great seller for like 30 years. She said, it's, it's over 200 years old. She said, well, it makes me go to the bathroom too much. I, I'm thinking she's taking too many, right? That's what you'd be thinking, because too much. I'm thinking logic of how much you actually should go. She's thinking, no, no. It's making me go too often. I go twice per week. Well, first she said, I go twice. I said, well, twice per day is not bad. You should probably go for every meal you eat. She goes, no, twice per week. I said, twice per week? I said, do you eat all week long? And she goes, yeah. And I said, where do you think that's going? Well, I don't know. You're storing it in a 98.6 degree fermented toxic area that's expanding your colon. She goes, well, I used to go to the bathroom once a week and now I go twice a week on your product because I'll take it on the weekend. So I said, so you're taking my product on the weekend. Yeah, because I don't want to go at the office. I'm making light of this, but it will be effective on multiple people because of the principle. So I said, well, that's fine. I'll refund your money but I think it's ridiculous. And I said, but let me ask you a question, final. What are you gonna do with the extra fecal matter that you used to be getting rid of on my product and now you're gonna go back to half that amount? She goes, no, more. it's more like a third of what I used to, I used to go about a third of what your product would make me go. I said, okay, so you're gonna have two thirds extra fecal matter, what are you gonna do with it? Are you storing it? Are you like a kangaroo? You have an extra pouch for your colon? I mean, think about it. What are you doing with it? It's poop. You got poop. The amount of poop that went in the toilet, you don't want to leave your body. You want to keep it inside your body instead of seeing it in the toilet. Does that make sense to me? No. Does that seem a little bit crazy? Yeah. I think that's insane. Not insane like lock you up insane. Insane like you need to make a better decision insane. Like, wow, stop doing that. Wherever you learn that from, stop. And start going to the bathroom correctly. And save your body. She goes, oh, wow, when you explain it that way, I think I'll keep the product. I said, it's your choice. You should probably take it more often and all week long, like every day. No, no, I don't want to go to the bathroom at the, at the office. I mean, does she work with lepers or something that maybe, you know, she's afraid of the toilet seat? I'd just clean it, sterilize it. Maybe just bring some stuff in and spray the toilet seat first. I'm just, you know, I'm just saying you could do all kinds of things. You could be as anal as you want and as clean as you want, but you still need to go to the bathroom the right amount of going to the bathroom. So how much is going to the bathroom correctly? Well, let's go over that. You need to take enough of the colon product so your lower bowel moves to this. Soft serve ice cream. Piled up like loamy earth, like um, a dump truck dumps out its earth, or wet cement piles up. Moist, wet, not in shape or form, not in sausage lengths, right? Not like this. But soft, it dissipates when you agitate the water, meaning you flush the water, it dissipates. 
It breaks down instantly. That is the correct amount or the right way that your fecal matter should appear. Anything less than that is incorrect. And you either need to drink more water, eat more roughage, take more product. One of the other. I don't know. It's up to you. So here's the thing. How do you take it? I would probably start with three pills tonight, four pills tomorrow night, six pills or five pills the next night, six pills the next night, seven pills the next night, and so on and so forth. I think the most I've heard is 18 to 20 pills. That's a severely constipated person. Um, and hopefully, as they get to that 18, they'll quickly be able to get down to an, a, a closer to normal level. Now there's skinny constipated people and big bellied constipated people. There are both. There are constipated people that when they start taking my product, even though they may be somewhat slender, they'll say, um, yeah, it, it, does the, it, it does this for me, it does this for me. Well, this is why. Sometimes by activating that large intestine, you'll get fecal matter to come off the wall so much faster that will actually stuff you up more and you'll think that you, wait a minute, this isn't working for me. It actually is. It's just that you are getting more off the wall faster than what you thought and it's gonna have a reverse effect. Some people are so constipated that only liquid comes out of their bowels because it's, it's all adding to the drain pipe. That happens too. So you have to be conscious of this, that all we're doing is moving and toning the colon. There's no way it can do something wrong for you. It can only do something right for you. Does that make sense? It's impossible for it to constipate you. Think about it. It's moving your colon. It's toning the colon wall. It is, well, it kills gram-negative, gram-positive bacteria. Um, it increases blood flow to the bowel wall. It tones it. It lubricates bile ducts. It lubricates the ducts on the wall of the colon. So it's going to be a healthier immune system for your colon. Now, in the first part of taking this, could you have some backlash? from doing that, from years of something else? Yes. Now, most people, 99.9% .9 of them, have parasites as well, just so you know, typically in the large intestines and then throughout the whole body. And it's a fascinating thing. So it's impossible for that product to constipate you, even though I do hear that as a response sometimes. So I'm trying to give you a, a better response now, and you can take it for whatever it's worth, is by getting the body to move out the fecal matter, sometimes the initial response for the first few months of that extra fecal matter coming out may seem the opposite of what you want. But after a while, you'll start cleaning better and getting better, and then it'll be more efficient, and then you'll be able to have those loamy bowel movements like we're talking about. Some people have so much fecal matter impacted that when they go to get a, a colonic, the colonics, now I... Um, I've heard this. I've never had mine tested personally, but they'll test your fecal matter and say how long it's been in your colon. And I've heard people say, I had stuff in my colon for 36 years. I just want to know what would that do to your body? Think about it. Fecal matter, poop, waste material, garbage, yuck, sitting there for 36 years. Anybody's Anybody get the heebie-jeebies on that? Because I do. <sighs> you think about that? That's disgusting. But that is in some people's body. That is going to happen. That is a response. You may sign up a distributor or a customer or talk to somebody and have a friend of yours purchase this product from you and have that kind of a response. They may have stuff that comes out like it's, it's like wood. It's like when things turn and solidifies and gets hard. And it sometimes it hurts when it comes out. Bowel movements should not hurt when they come out. You should not have to bear down with your abdominal muscles to have a bowel movement. You should have the 23 to 26 rhythms of the colon to move that fecal matter out. The, the descending colon should evacuate quite rapidly. For the amount that most people need to go to the bathroom to pee, 
should be the almost the same amount of time that it takes you to evacuate your descending colon. Now, when you sit back up, you're done, you go to the bathroom, you're done, you walk around, you may have to come back because now the transverse colon will go through and drop down into the descending colon. And you might, in a 30 minutes to 15 minutes, you might have to evacuate again. That's a good thing. Do it. Some people up to three times and all three sections of the large intestines evacuate and what you'll have at the end, this is actually prime, is a little bit of liquid, like water. Because when you get up in the morning and you drink one liter of water, clean water, that will get your bowels to be have water moistness and move out. Through the night, we get dehydrated. And when we're dehydrated, the first place our body goes to extract moisture is our large intestines, puts it to the brain, puts it to the heart. Another interesting thing is our saliva. We do not produce saliva, which is killing bacteria in our mouths all day long. Um, and so we're not producing saliva like nine tenths um, while we're sleeping. Therefore, we don't drool all over our pillows. And so when we wake up, we have bad breath, don't we? And this is why everybody's breath's a little different. And everybody's saliva is a little different because it has hormones in it and painkillers and has all kinds of things and it's killing bacteria and all of us are a little different. So that saliva, that's why we have bad breath. So then once saliva starts going, the bad breath will, it will kill all that stuff, but we'll usually brush our teeth in the morning and then your saliva will start production and you'll start killing all that bacteria again. So it's an interesting thing of what happens when you're asleep, then you get dehydrated and you, ex you take that, large intestines, you take moisture from that, that's expendable moisture, and send it to the body, especially on very cold nights when, when it's dry or very hot days and nights when, when we're having a lot hard time keeping enough uh, moisture in our bodies. So the first thing you do is you drink a big, big thing of water, about one liter of water when you wake up in the morning. That will help you evacuate your colon within about 30 minutes. Now you may evacuate two to three times more after that. That is correct. Then that little bit of clean water at the end knows you're down to the end. You're down to the clean colon. Now, what happens? Well, now your liver and your spleen can dump out its putrescence into the colon as toxins to get them to evacuate because there's nothing in its way. Now you're going to clean your liver and your colon. By, I mean, your liver and your spleen. Now that your liver and your spleen are getting clean, all that blood that is now clean will clean every cell in the body. Now you're going to be a healthier, cleaner person. And we're going to get rid of those toxins, heavy metals, pollutants, all the, all the bad things that we're taking from the air, the water, our food, all those things. Now they're going to get clean. Okay, so that's one way of getting much, much, much healthier than what we would have been before. So the, the only thing is on this formula is you need to take it correctly. Take it before bed, take the right amount, start tonight with say one to three. I would start with three, see how your bowel movement is tomorrow. The next day, add one, add one. If you have what people call the squirts, where you go to the bathroom too rapidly and not very much substance comes out, you've taken too many. Most of the time, this is because people skip. They'll go, well, instead of taking four tonight, I'm going to take 10. And then they take 10. 10 might be too many. They may need seven or eight. So then what you want to do is you want to back off one per night until you have a good loamy bowel movement the next night. That's the opposite effect. Okay. okay. So we're talking about the colon and how people don't go to the bathroom when their urges are. The first thing you have to remember is when you feel that urge to go to the bathroom, do not put that aside. You need to go to the first closest potty you can go, okay? When you don't go with those urges, you will stop your body from having the sensitivity to the urges and therefore constipation will be the result. You've got to go on those urges. When that inner and outer sphincter, when it goes to the inner sphincter through the sigmoid, which is down here right there close, when that fills up with fecal matter and it gets pressure, that pressure will give you the sensation of, I need to evacuate. And that's what you have to do. And then it will allow the outer sphincter 
to release the, the, the fecal matter. Now, if you've had your prostate cut out, you lose the strength of the inner outer sphincter. And a lot of those guys, and this is sad, um, this is why I'd rather those guys just be on our superior man and pro man, um, or especially pro man, and save that problem, is that they will go potty in their pants and they're 60, 70 years old. And that's sad. And they and these are grown men and they don't want to do that, but they've removed their abilities. So the other thing that is important is I teach this to people. Now watch this on the on the colon is what you want to do is you can actually give yourself peristaltic stimulation by either rubbing the feet and just go and look at the chart and rub the feet in, in accordance and or coming up like this, go up over and down when you come down here pull it in right here so pull it in gently and massage it that's where the descending colon meets the sigmoid that is a tender spot if you feel a oh a sharp pain be gentle now just roll your hand with your palm up over or you can walk it with your fingers and walk that bow line from right down here by your appendix up the ascending over the transverse, now you can't go into your ribs, but you can rub and massage that in motions in this direction. What you're doing is you're stimulating peristalsis from the outside and loosening up fecal matter. You will find within a few minutes, you can have a bowel movement. I did this on a lady who had surgery and typically with surgery and painkillers, it will numb up your colon. It goes in there, numbs all those nerves. So painkillers make you constipated because you're numb in all your nerves, not just these nerves. It's these nerves too. It's all nerves. So it numbs those up. You get constipated. So I rubbed that. I rubbed her feet. And what I do is I take some of our colon clean product. I'll take about 10 capsules. I'll empty them into a little glass with some olive oil, about a tablespoon of olive oil. Mix it together, maybe two tablespoons. Mix it with castor oil, which is even better than olive oil. Castor oil is a lubricative laxative, but it works on the stomach. You can put it with the colon formula as well as on the feet. Even just rubbing it on the feet will work. And massage those feet in the same direction as this, down to the sigmoid, and then pull that sigmoid in, kind of straighten out that bent spot like this, and you'll allow that fecal matter to move down and get in there. Make sure you drink plenty of water and you will evacuate your colon. I've done this with constipated people, severely constipated people, even 400 pound, 200 kilo people. I've massaged their feet. I've had them put it on their bowels and it goes. That's a wonderful thing. The other thing is how the body likes to sit. The problem is, is Japanese toilets are perfect. They're squat. They squat. And in the squat, when you squat, you elongate the colon, the sigmoid, and everything, and it's just a straight line, and you evacuate. Our toilets, the, the British American toilets, which is where they're developed, but it's still, that toilet makes us have a hard time going to the bathroom. So we don't, we evacuate like 20 to 30% less in a sitting position than you do in a squatting position. So you can buy one of those things called a squatty potty that, that sits underneath your toilet, or you can just build a little platform or buy a little stool. You know, one of those kids step stools works perfect. And then have your feet up so your knees are up. So you're like you're squatting and you will go to the bathroom so much better. And you'll notice about a 20 or more percent evacuation rate rather than sitting, which is not good. The other thing is, is people bend over like this, and that's hard. Don't squeeze down with your abdominal tissue. This is why children that are not breastfed have hernias. They get constipated, they bear down, and that fragile third layer of abdominal tissue that keeps all the colon in place will rip. Because, think about it. When you, when you put, this is a colon that's enlarged and pushing out on the abdominal. You've seen people with puffy bowels, especially kids, there's no room. So it pushes out. 
When you drape a sheet or cloth over something, you can tear it much easier than if it's straight. If it's straight the way the bowel tissue should be, we should all have flat stomachs. If we don't have flat tummies, I myself notice when I eat air, airport food or airline food, my stomach gets distended. And I immediately are like, oh my gosh, what did they have in there? Probably some preservative, something that's not digesting. If it's a preservative, what does it do? It fights decomposing. And so by fighting the decomposing, it's a preservative. Your body then fights to digest it and break it down. That's your body's order of execution, is to break things down. By putting preservatives into it, is like those vitamin pills that all the guys with septic tanks say, yeah, I, I know what kind of vitamins don't work. Really, how do you know? He goes, because the name's still on the pill. They don't break down, they're shellacked, they're lacquered. It's the same thing as those bad foods and we don't digest them. If you're not taking the greens and you're not producing the 60 different enzymes by taking the greens, just from the matter of six B6s you get in the greens, and you're not having the increase of hydrochloric acid by taking the greens, you're not digesting your sugars, fats, and proteins the same, you can have more of a bloated bowel. Try it, try the product, use the product, it will aid you in your digestion, even though the greens is not a digestion product. The colon is to move the lower bowels, but we need to remember, we all have stuff stopped up for years before you guys were on these great products. We have to fight that battle. So what do we do? We massage the colon. If you're feeling constipated because you went out to dinner with somebody and you didn't eat as healthy as what you think you should, which is probably true, then massage that colon this way. Get your spouse or, or a friend or a family member to rub your feet and or and then make sure you rub in that 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 right down here at the descending where it goes into the sigmoid and make sure you take the right amount of colon clean product. Then make sure you have that stool in your bathroom. So in every one of your bathrooms so that you are in a squat position so that you can evacuate your bowels much, much, much more efficiently. That is so important to your bowel health. People don't take it seriously. They don't understand. We are built to squat. The, the Asians, they squat. Their toilets are just a little hole in the ground. I know that's unattractive. It looks much better to have our big, beautiful toilets, but they're much worse for you. And so move around. The other thing you can do while you're massaging that, when you're sitting on the toilet, and I know this is an embarrassing thing for a guy to be telling you about, but when you're sitting on the toilet, you can move around and get that to move and get these while you're massaging them, get them, stretch it and move it by stretching and moving things. You're going to get them to move and have that peristalsis. As soon as the fecal matter moves inside that wall, it creates peristalsis. Remember, those drugs, those painkillers that people take, they kill the sensation, which also stops you from having good bowel movements. So if you can take our natural painkillers, um, which work fantastically, then that would be a much better thing because they won't constipate you. And so I hope that helps. Having a healthy colon is the end result that we all need. Remember the quote that my great, great, great grandfather said over 200 years ago, the colon is the root of all problems or the root of all diseases or the root of all illnesses or the root of all evil, whatever they want to call it. And Professor, uh, Dr. Kellogg's said the same thing and Professor Graham who created Graham flour, which to get the colon clean. Also Professor Earhart, all these people have said the same thing. Dr. Linus Pauling, um, all these people are saying the same thing about the colon. You've got to get a clean colon and a healthy colon is a healthy body. That is your core in your body that you have to have clean. If that's clean, everything else will start cleaning and you'll be much healthier because of it. So the other thing that you can do is eat better. You need to eat healthy. Remember, eat to live. Don't live to eat. Okay? Just good pearls of wisdom. And as your grandmother probably always taught you, eat your greens. Eat your green leafy vegetables. Eat your vegetables. Eat all those healthy things. Eat for nutrition. When I'd make lasagna for my kids, I'd sneak in as much nutrition as I could get into those kids. I want the potency of nutrition in the unprocessed, unrefined, and unadulterated format. 
I believe in the greens every day because it's the only place you're going to get all 106 minerals and 54 vitamins. I just think that's uh, absolutely an utmost for everybody. That's my personal opinion. And everybody that does it seems to have healthier hair, healthier teeth, healthier skin, healthier eyes, and healthier everything. Your fingernails start growing better. Your skin and your complexion will start looking better. And your eyes will start looking cleaner. Remember, because we're going to look at eyes, skin, nails, hair, all those kind of things to see about health. Those are all symbols of health. Okay. So then also when your bowels clean, you're also going to be able to burn up body fat a lot easier. And when you hydrate, you're going to utilize stored body fat for energy a lot more. When you take the greens, you're going to start utilizing stored body fat for energy more. When your colon's working, you're getting rid of toxins. A lot of fat cells are toxin-based fat cells. And then those will be utilized as energy better because you can get rid of the toxin. Okay, be careful with what animals you touch, what animals you pet. There's lots of parasites that you can get. If you snuggle your dog, you very well could get pinworms through its muscles to your muscles, those kind of problems. Um, I, hope that, I hope that you guys learned something today. I hope it was uh, fun. I hope it was informative.